Thanks, everyone, for joining us for this Faithfully Magazine live Q&A. Uh, we are speaking with Dr. Claudrina Harold. Dr. Harold is a history professor and also chair of the history department at the University of Virginia. Uh, we're talking with Dr. Harold today about her latest book, When Sunday Comes, Gospel Music in the Soul and Hip Hop Eras. As the title suggests, When Sunday Comes, uh, takes a look at gospel music after the civil rights era. So that's, you know, late 60s, 70s and onward. Uh, it gets into folks like James Cleveland, uh, Shirley Caesar, the Winans, Kirk Franklin and so forth and so on. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Harold, for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Absolutely. Um, and I do have to say, I really did enjoy reading uh, When Sunday Comes. I, I just have an interest in, you know, certain aspects of Christianity um, and gospel music, I feel like, is one particular aspect that doesn't get a lot of, um, I don't know, coverage or common discussion. Uh, so I do appreciate you putting this work out. Um, and so one of the things I want to jump in with um, that I noticed right away uh, in When Sunday Comes uh, is, you know, you use the term gospel. Uh, and then like in the same sentence, like you're differentiating it somehow, uh, you'll use Christian music. Uh, so for those of us, you know, who don't know the distinctions uh, of gospel music from just Christian music, uh, can you explain that for us? Sure, sure. Um, once again, thanks for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to talk about this book with Sunday Comes, and it's a pleasure to be able to talk about this book with um, Faithfully Magazine. I think a central theme in the book is how um, critical institutions outside of just, you know, um, musicians are in advancing this art form. So uh, it's a pleasure to, to be with you. Uh, and yes, I use the term gospel music and Christian music and sometimes contemporary Christian music um, and um, I use them for different reasons. When I think about gospel music, I think about that vibrant art form that is a part of the Black sacred tradition that's connected to uh, the spirituals uh, that really developed in Chicago in the late 1920s and the early 1930s, and that grew in the 1940s and 50s. And we related to Thomas Dorsey and Mahalia Jackson and, you know, Sam Cooke and the great quartets. And so this book is about the evolution of that music from, uh, you know, the James Clevelands and the commissions and the Winans. When I say contemporary Christian music or Christian music, I'm thinking about that predominantly white uh, genre of religious music that really, you know, emerged um, as a field in the 1960s and the 1970s, and that was sort of connected to the Jesus movement. And so I'm thinking about people like Keith Green and, and the, you know, people like Sandy Patty and Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith. But of course, um, a person like Andre Crouch makes this very complicated because while he is central uh, to gospel music history. He's also central. Uh, he's a key architect of the contemporary Christian music sound. And so I use those terms to sort of de de delineate which, you know, sort of aesthetic and artistic forms that I'm talking about. And of course, there are people in this, um, in this book that navigate sort of both spaces. And that includes people like Andre Crouch, um, B.B. and C.C. Winans, for example, I think Contemporary Christian Music Magazine once had like the 10 greatest uh, Christian albums of all time. And I think B.B. and C.C. were the high, they had the highest ranked album, I think, with Heaven, um, whereas Kirk Franklin was like in the late 20s or something. So, you know, um, so that's what I when I when I talk about those terms, that's what I'm, I'm talking about. And of course, that's been a theme um, in recent years about those those divisions in terms of gospel and contemporary Christian music. So that's what I mean. In no way am I suggesting that people who sing gospel are not Christians. I just want right, to I know you know that. So, yeah. OK. Um, and you mentioned a lot of uh, interesting things there that I do want to touch on, uh, particularly with Andre Crouch and how he kind of straddles both worlds, right? Both worlds. Um, same thing with the Winans. Um, but before we get to that, uh, I do want to uh, find out uh, because, you know, if you're going to spend all this time, and I believe it took you like years, right, to put everything together for this book. Um, and you talk a lot about it, too, um, in the book. You know, you talk about gospel from a personal place because you grew up listening to it. It was always around you. 
Um, so I'm wondering uh, if you could just tell us briefly, you know, what kind of research out of your own, you know, personal knowledge and interest did you do for this book in terms of the music you listen to? Like, do you have like a lengthy Spotify playlist somewhere? Um, you know, and I assume you visited churches, maybe talked to local key businesses. Um, so tell us about that. Maybe some of the artists you spoke with. Sure. So this book was definitely a labor of love. Um, cool. It is a book that I feel as if I have been researching my entire life. Wow. Probably since, you know, my first gospel concert. But it was a book that I was very reluctant to write. Um, my work is on African-American history and culture, really in the 1920s. Um, I had already written books before. Um, I did, had done, I've done some film. And this was like my, music is my sanctuary. It's my joy. It's a source of spiritual sustenance. And sometimes as a researcher and a writer, you don't want to actually bring other people into that space. Oh, I can understand um, that. I've also, you know, changed politically. So there are some things that I loved listening to in the 1970s and the 1980s mm -hmm. that I listen to now and it kind of makes me cringe. Um, but um I just, I, you know, I was seeing all of this wonderful scholarship about gospel music and so much, so much of it focused on um, the 19, the golden era of gospel music, you know, mm -hmm. the, the 1940s and 50s and 60s. And I grew up in the 1980s loving the music of Commission and the Winans and uh, being really a fanatic. Right. Uh, and I wanted to see those people talked about with the same passion and scholarly um, rigor that I saw people talking about Mahalia Jackson and, and, you know, the Dixie Hummingbirds. And so I made a decision. I think I made this decision in 2016 that I would write an article on James Cleveland and the Gospel Music Workshop of America and see how, let's see how that goes. And it evolved into just the book. So the writing of the book, the researching of the book, um, it took me in new places, but it all so it took me to old places. So, you know, I, I grew up, like I said, I was a fanatic. So I grew up, wow. collecting. I'm, a, I'm a collector too. So I'm a gospel collector. So this is like an Andre Crouch comic book from wow. the 1970s. And most importantly, like I grew up reading, you know, gospel magazines. So like contemporary. Wow, look at that old magazine. cover. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and so I had all of this stuff and mm -hmm. stuff that, you know, my mom didn't throw out when I wouldn't clean up my room. <laughs> I went and rebought. And so I'm also just a collector in terms of albums. So in terms of the research, first of all, just getting all of the music and listening to it. Mm. And so for gospel music, that also meant sometimes digging in record crates, digging in record shops and buying the actual album, because so many gospel albums that have been reissued are kind of reissued and CDs that don't sometimes have liner notes, you know? Oh, right. So I wanted to get like all of those things. And so first of all, it was just building and going back to my um, my album base. And then also just reading um, as much as I could from prominent um, gospel music magazines. And I'm talking about magazines like uh, Totally Gospel. They came out of Detroit in the 1980s by T.J. Hemphill. Um, uh, contemporary Christian music, but which is also complicated because it covered uh, Andre Crouch and really BB and CC Winans and Tate Sis, but you were not going to find a detailed article on James Cleveland there. Mm. But also I relied a lot on, I mean, it's Black History Month, and so I just must, must say this, I relied on Black newspapers. Mm. Yeah, you know, makes sense. to the development of gospel music was, you know, the Norfolk Journal and Guide and the Chicago Defender and these Black journalists who treated the music and the musicians with the utmost respect and wrote detailed uh, album reviews and concert reviews. And, you know, I also relied on Johnson Publication. Okay. So Ebony and Jed, of course, course. we have these, um, I call them annual conversations, you know, has gospel gone too far? You know, that was like, and so that was extremely important, but then also digging into archives. So like going to Duke University and finding an interview that they had done with old, you know, with t tobacco workers from the 1940s and the 50s at Leggett and Myers. And one of those tobacco workers was Shirley Caesar's mother, oh, Hallie wow. Mae Caesar. Um, and then I found the treasure trove at UNC had all the Floyd McKissick papers with CORE. And there was the gospel music workshop um, of America um, 
their papers. And also I go to, I, I attended two conventions. And so the Gospel Music Workshop of America has this, um, you know, this, you know, their, their weekly convention, but they have an academic division where they bring out what they call the world's largest traveling library. And so I would just go there and um, sit down with the folks and talk to the folks. So I attended the 2017 convention that was the 50th anniversary celebration. And it was just an amazing thing, you know? So I, 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 um, I stand on the shoulders of those who love the, the music and love researching the history. Okay, all right. And uh, I don't know, maybe throw out um, two or three of your personal favorite, if favorite is the right word, uh, the artists you always go to. Yeah, so um, I've been thinking a lot about this um, ever since the um, the Capitol insurrection of January the sixth, and the you know the invoking of Charlottesville. Um, mm. You know, I was in Charlottesville. I teach. I've been living in Charlottesville for seventeen years, and it brought back memories of um, the week before class. You know, the Charlottesville Unite the Right rallies were uh, August eleventh and twelfth, and they were like two weeks before class. And what a lot of people don't know or maybe don't recognize is that. Um, those white supremacists still hadn't been banned from campus. And so a lot of us were preparing for class, not knowing. And I remember being, you know, I'm cool. I'm, you know, I'm fine. And that first day of class, I remember walking and feeling my nerves were rattled. Mm -hmm. And I did what I always do. I grabbed them for my, I, I reached for my iPod and I didn't want to hear though I love it. I didn't want to hear classic soul or R and B. I didn't want to hear <laughs> hip hop though I love. I love jazz. I had to hear some James Cleveland. Mm -hmm. I had to hear some Commission. I had to hear some some Winans. I had to hear some Shirley Caesar. You know, Satan, we're gonna tear your kingdom down. I needed that kind of music. So when you say what are some of my favorites, um, I'm a huge Winans fan. Um, I've been a huge Winans fan since the um, 1980s. I love Detroit gospel. So the Winans Commission, um, the Clark sisters, but the Winans, the four brothers, uh, have a special place uh, in my heart. So, you know, if I hear millions didn't make it or I hear question is or if I hear I'm, I'm, I'm pulling off to the side. Um, and, and that music was so central to my sort of spiritual development, but also my intellectual development, um, commission. I was listening to ordinary just won't do. And that's like, a that's a mantra for me about how I want to live my life. Um, James Cleveland, um, when my dad died, um, in the mid 1980s, and I can remember me and my mom had to go and live with my aunt. And my aunt would play this James Cleveland album that featured the New Jersey Mass Choir um, every day. <laughs> and it got on my nerves. And it's like now I find myself constantly listening to that album or listening to, you know, Peace Be Still or This Too Shall Pass. That's the song that I listen to. Um, you know, that's the song that I listened to when I was getting ready to go back to class in 2017, you know this too shall pass. And he says, I don't care what you got, high blood, low blood, no blood at all. Mm -hmm. This too shall pass. And so those are some of my, um, you know, just some of my songwriters favorites, uh, definitely Marvin Winans, Andre Crouch, uh, Shirley Caesar, to me is the greatest performer ever. I love James Cleveland as an institution builder. Mm -hmm. I think about the gospel music workshop of America and how do we maintain this culture I love Tate Sits and Sounds of Blackness for the ways in which they embrace all the genres of Black music, jazz, um, the spirituals, and are attempting to make a statement, I think, about the beauty of, of the music. You know, technically, it doesn't get any better for me than Vanessa Bell Armstrong and the Clark sisters. So, you know, I love people for different reasons. And the Southerner in me, John P. Key, you know, outside the county line, <laughs> you know, uh, and Al Green. And so um, the people, you know, my book is organized around artists and it's organized kind of like a collective biography. And those are the people I'm passionate about. Okay. And, you know, you spent a lot of time there mentioning uh, the significance of James Cleveland and kind of the foundation he built for gospel music. Mm -hmm. um, so jumping ahead a bit to some of the other artists, um, when I got to the section about the Hawkins, 
um, especially with their song, Oh, Happy Day. Uh, you know, of course, I immediately thought of, oh, you know, Sister Act, that, that scene in Sister Act when they're singing Sister Act 2 when they're singing Oh, Happy Day. And, you know, I was reading, I was like, oh, wow, such a huge crossover success. And I think you mentioned it was like the first gospel track to like go gold, I think it was. Um, and so I was like, let me pull up, you know, I can find some footage on YouTube. So I, I'm playing it and I, I noticed, first off, it sounds much different than what I heard in Sister Act 2. Um, and forgive me for being ignorant about that. Um, and I'm like, this is a jam. And then I'm like, wait a minute, they even loved it in, you know, European countries. They got mainstream play. I'm like, who's two-stepping to like wash my sins away? You know what I mean? When I'm looking at the lyrics and, you know, you're listening to it. This is a song you can, you know, enjoy in the sense of you can, you know, kind of dance and celebrate and praise to it. So I was kind of impressed, like, wow, this very gospel centric song has such a wide appeal. And so, of course, you know, while the Hawkinsons are enjoying mainstream or secular success with this track, uh, I think I read also, you know, I think it was Edwin Hawkins, perhaps, who said how almost discouraged he was when he got feedback from church communities who were not pleased right. with the secular success, um, you know, because they weren't the first ones, of course, to be pushing in that direction. Uh, so talk about some of that conflict. You know, I, I would think it's a great thing that gospel, uh, especially if you are religious, uh, you do want the gospel music and message to be pushed out further. But, you know, what were the concerns of people within the church who were resistance, resistant to that movement? Sure. So, I mean, Kirk Franklin was not the first artist that the gospel community, some members of the gospel community said, you've taken this too far. Mm -hmm. And that is a that is a theme actually throughout gospel music. I mean, it, initially, Thomas Dorsey wasn't embraced. You mm -hmm. know, there was this notion that it was just too much blues in in that music. Um but there has always been, you know, this this criticism and this concern about crossover. And it, it definitely was amplified with the success of Oh Happy Day. That was just a, a crossover hit, an international hit. It crossed over in terms of um, into the secular arena, but also crossed over into the, you know, sort of the white world. Um, and you see these complaints about, you know, being too secular, incorporating too much funk or too much jazz or too much hip hop um, later. Um, and I think there is a concern about, a concern about form. Mm -hmm. So what happens if you begin to incorporate certain sounds? Do you dilute the message? You know, so I think that raises this question question of sonically, can spirit be, be maintained in certain forms? Um, do you lose spirit when you begin to embrace different sounds? You know, and so even think about now some of the debates that people have, it's not about crossover, but it's something lost when you go from the mass choir sound to the praise and worship sound. You know, like, you know, some people are like this is not hitting. <laughs> right. um, but, you know, so there is this in concern about incorporation. The problem with that is black music and particularly gospel music is always reinventing itself. It's always crossing over. It's always um, sort of trying uh, new things. And so some of the debates, I think, are about sound. Some of it's about cultural preservation. So, I, you know, you take a person like James Cleveland, and I don't think he was concerned about, you know, the disco sound. So he had this big debate with the Mighty Clouds of Joy over Mighty High, which is a big crossover hit, which interestingly enough, my, my uncle wrote the song. But that's a whole nother story. Okay. Um, but I think for him, it was about, I want young people to also know the traditional stuff, because this is a part of our heritage. This is a part of who we are. And so I think that's part of it too. Um, I think there's also this notion of, well, I want gospel to sound like gospel. If I go to a blues concert, Rance Allen, I was reading this interview with Rance Allen and he was in, performing in Chicago. And this is like doing, I think the, the, the 80s, but I think he may have been reflecting on the 70s. And, you know, he goes through, you know, his stuff is just 
amazing, but also just ultra funky in the 70s. And I think a, um, a crowd member yelled, if I went to go to a blues concert, I would have gone to a blues concert. And so I think there's also for gospel artists, this expectation that they're working with about what gospel should sound like. And sometimes you even get that from sort of music critics who have this kind of monolithic idea about what a gospel, a black gospel performance should be. And so I think um, I think all of that is happening. And I also think when people begin to cross over into sometimes the contemporary Christian music industry or the secular music industry, I think those that fan base doesn't want to feel as if they're losing you. You know, and I think Walter Hawkins did a great job of articulating this sometimes like, okay, you know, you're ours. And so I think that's also a dynamic. And this is what I actually think makes Kurt Franklin so important and so distinct. He had this capacity, even when he was crossing over and even when he was, you know, stomped. I think there were just so many people in the church and in the gospel community um, who felt as if he was still theirs. And I don't know if that's because the beginning of his journey was, you know, the reason why I sing. And, you know, in the 90s, you couldn't go to a church without somebody singing that. It was like gospel's greatest love of all. You're just like, oh, wow. Um, so I think some people are able to navigate that kind of, um, they're able to communicate what they're doing. But it's about form. It's about, it's about, um, it's about protecting that art form, um, that when people are marching in the 1960s, when you say, you know, I ain't going to let nobody turn me around. It's something about the power, too, of that music. And I think also the form. Mm -hmm. So um, there's something I do feel when I listen to Thompson Community Choir. And it's a particular form. So I think um, what I wanted to do was understand the debates, show the debates, but also try to understand both sides of the debates in terms of maintaining the vibrancy and the diversity of the culture. Okay, okay. And I want to jump to Shirley Caesar a bit and hopefully get into, um, you know, the ways in which gospel music and the industry that was building up uh, impacted, um, you know, the African-American singers who were performing and how they used it as a platform in a sense um, for a kind of holistic ministry, I guess you would say. Like I'm thinking of Shirley Caesar, who ran for local office, which I never knew before I picked up this book and actually won. And, you know, for her, I think it was just a matter of taking what she believed about the gospel and applying it also into the things she focused on for her local community. And you emphasize that too in the book, how um, kind of like the local communities these artists are coming from, in a sense, they're kind of taking them with them when their platform expanded and speaking to the things also happening there. Um, so kind of, I don't know, speak about how the, it was just more, it was more about the music, music. It was a movement in a sense to bring uplift and also, you know, impact some type of real change. Right. So Shirley Caesar is one of the most innovative and fascinating artists of any genre. And she reflects all of the beauty and complexity of humanity and also Black life. You know, a native of Dorm, North Carolina, the daughter of tobacco workers, a genius, uh, one of the greatest performers of any genre, but someone who never lost a sense of her North Carolina Black dorm roots. Um, she is a product of what it means to, I think, be anointed, but she is also a product of a community that nurtured her. She is a product of Black dorm. She's a product of North Carolina Central. She's a product of Shaw University. She's a product of the baddest gospel group ever, the Caravans. She's a product of um, that community. And Shirley Caesar's longevity is amazing. I think she is arguably the greatest artist and in some ways the most underrated. I think we have not fully, even my, myself included, she's the one person that I kept saying this could be an auto, you know, this could be a biography. 
Um, and she has her own autobiography and it's, it's wonderful um, because she's also about self-preservation and self-presentation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, born in 1938, you know, brilliant, known as Baby Shirley, um, moves to the caravans, um, joins the caravans in 19, I think, 58, uh, leaves the caravans in 1966, gets all that training, um, then strikes out on her own. Heavily recruited, she goes to HOB Records, makes these amazing records. And records that I should know that's rare sometimes in gospel in this period, they're amazing from beginning to end. This book is also, I think, about artists, but great records. And she just makes, but she's always about the business. She's always about trying to put herself in the best situation. And it's about protecting the art form, but she's also about what's happening in the Black community. So in her records in the 1960s, you hear references to poverty. You hear records to the civil rights movement. You hear records, um, references to Vietnam. She's also attentive to class conflict that's beginning to happen in this moment. So, you know, the song, Don't Throw Your Mama Away, a classic sermonette, is very much about, okay, there's this middle class member of the family, you know, there's this... Um, quote, no good son, who actually comes to the rescue at the end of the song. But she's also raising this question, what as an, what is going to be our relationship to each other as African-Americans? As this civil rights movement begins to show manifestations, material manifestations, what are we going to, what's our relationship to the, to the Black folk, the working class folk who get left behind? who were hit hard by deindustrialization and a loss of jobs. Shirley Caesar is, is also responding to those realities out of the Christian tradition of, we have to respond to the community. We have to be attentive to the least of these. So in some ways to me, she's the, the musical variant of also liberation theology. And she just continues this in the seventies. All the while, she's innovating. So Shirley Caesar can do traditional gospel. She can sign with Roadshow and do some of the funkiest stuff you've ever heard. And then she's like, okay, no charge. Okay, yeah, Melba Montgomery, that was cool. But I'm about to give me this country stuff too, because I am from North Carolina. So she's, I mean, she's underrated to me in that sense. I mean, I think to label her just con- traditional it misses the point. So she can do a funk, uh, an album with funk elements in the late 1970s, sign with Word Records. And of course, she was one of the first African-American artists kind of signed with Word. Hook up with a North Carolinian, Tony Brown, who's known for country music. And then say like, yeah, Bob Dylan, I'm going to sing your song. You got to serve somebody, you know, and I'm going to kill it. And then you fast forward 1987, you get Shouting John. You know, John joined a dead church. They didn't believe in dancing. They didn't believe in speaking in tongues. That same year she runs, around that same time, she runs for city council because she's also saying it's not enough for me to talk about this in my songs. It's not enough for me to just do benefits and charity. I got to shape public policy. So I think the challenge for us as we think about this moment and we deal with, you know, race racism in the body of Christ and economic exploitation. And I think sometimes we have a tendency to think, well, if we all just come together in Kumbaya and if we're just all in a place of worship, no, our commitment to God is also evident by what we're thinking about in terms of public policy. So she's like, yeah, I'm running. So she ran for a seat on the city council and served in that position for four years. Um, Her She's singular in so many ways. Um, and uh, she deserves our love and respect. Sorry if I went on. No, no. Shirley Caesar is definitely a giant, a living giant. That's the thing. Uh, she's still with us and she's still putting out work. And, you know, she has a church. So, you know, uh, she's ministering to people there, too. So uh, no problem with going on about Shirley Caesar. Uh, I love her. Um, but I... Go ahead. Let me just say this too. Mm-hmm. You talked about process. Mm-hmm. It was important for me to go to dorm and go to the house where she was born. Wow. And so in the book, I also have a picture of that street, Shirley Caesar. 
um, it was important for me. It's always important for me too to be in those spaces. So uh, I, 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 I went to her church. Um, then later I had to walk that I had to feel, you know, I had to feel that space. And it was the same way with Walter Hawkins. Um, I traveled to Oakland and, and, you know, I wanted to go to that, to the bookstore, like Reed's records. I mean, the gospel store. Um, but I also wanted to, I wanted to feel what it was like for him to, you know, play for Ephesian, but also play for other churches and just, just inhabit the spaces that he inhabited. You know, I went to Detroit, I had to go to King Solomon and see where, you know, James Cleveland, the first gospel music workshop of America, and then to understand and do that walk from King Solomon to Bethel Baptist, where the great C.L. Franklin preached and gave us Aretha Franklin, because what I began to see within that community and in the context of segregation and all of that stuff, all of these people are very close geographically to each other. And so part of my research was walking, was, mm. was really walking and trying to inhabit that space. Wow. Wow. I can only imagine. That's great. Yeah. Um, and so I guess let's turn a bit to maybe some of the racial dynamics, right? And I don't know, I guess the Winans, since we spoke a bit about uh, Franklin, I guess, the Winans. And they did really break ground in terms of crossover, not just secular, but also into the white Christian world, so to speak. Um, you mentioned they were signed by uh, the Baker's PTL Club, I think it's called, you can correct me. Um, and, you know, I love C.C. Winans. I gravitate more toward her music than B.B., uh, but they're both giants, of course, the entire Winans family. Um, and there's another element, too, you know, uh, when you start talking about the racial dynamics and, you know, the shock, uh, I think you describe of uh, C.C. having uh, and suddenly being in this white world, so to speak, um, and the, the difference in terms of, you know, response to the music, you know, she's used to the call and response kind of in the black church. And then when she's performing for a white audience, she doesn't know if they're feeling it or what, because there's no type of emotive response or whatever. Uh, but what are some of the some ground they broke in terms of kind of, I don't know, breaking down racial barriers in a sense? Uh, how did it work out when they crossed over into that world and what kind of positive or negative changes came out of that? Right. So um, in many ways, BB and CC traveled the road that Andre Crouch paved. And the gospel music industry, the Christian music industry is reflective of larger dynamics, I think, in religion, American religion. You know, Dr. King said that Sunday at 11 a.m. is the most segregate, segregated hour in America. And um, those patterns are also present in music. And so when you think about contemporary Christian music, um, you did not hear a lot of Black artists that were not named, say, Leon Patillo or Larnell Harris or Andre Crouch. And, and even the Winans, the four brothers who, you know, they're the begin. They were the first stars. Um, they didn't cross over into the white Christian industry like that. In fact, I think even in the late 1980s, Marvin Winans complained about um, having a seat. And I want to make sure I'm correct, but like in the balcony of the Dove Awards. Mm -hmm. um, when you think about like the Dove Awards, and that is like, you know, the award ceremony for the Gospel Music Association, you know, how many African-Americans win Artists of the Year or Group of the Year. And so one of the things that you you, they, you begin to see with BB and CC um, and then take six around the same time is that they were winning these um, categories that had been uh, traditionally just won by by white artists. And, and some of this is as the, the white evangelical community is also opening up. So in a post sort of civil rights moment, um, tele-evangel tele-evangelism, um, you know, they, they hook up with PTL in 1984 and PTL, you know, is huge and they are PTL singers. And so in many ways, that's the beginning of their introduction into this um, predominantly um, white world. And interestingly enough, African American Christians also watch the show, um, but they are hugely, um, hugely important. I mean, their first album crosses over, so they're being played on. Um, well, PTL actually puts out an album, 
um, it's hard to find, but there's a BBNCC album that became part of their package to um, um, donors. It, it's that's a whole nother right. uh, story. Um, and then they signed with Sparrow Records, which doesn't actually have a lot of black artists. And it 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 bear at that time, and it bears noting sometimes the black artists who signed with Sparrow would sometimes complain that they felt as if they were put on the back burner because of um, BB and CC Winans. But they come out with their album in 87 and it does really well. And then Heaven comes out and it just blows up. I mean, it is it is officially, these gospel records in terms of gold are always interesting because you'll hear people say, oh, I had a gospel album and it sold five, you know, 500,000 copies. But in terms of RIAA certification, um, BB and CC were actually the first gospel black gospel act since aretha franklin's amazing grace to go gold and so they went gold with heaven in 1988 um also um helped by the appearance um of whitney houston who was on that album and you know when you think about the fact that whitney uh, you know she's the biggest star she's huge right at that moment she's just like traveling with them. Sometimes if you were like following them during this period, if you was in New York or LA, it was not uncommon for you to look at the background singers and Whitney would be in the middle, you know? And so, um, so they cross over, they win a lot of double wars. And then of course their 1991 album, um, different lifestyles goes platinum. And so in between that period, you know, during that period, you also get Tate six, um, who also have that crossover appeal. So once again, and I, I know this is not showing tell, but I think it's important when you think about CCM. Like black people didn't get on the cover of this, right? So it's like that's Andre Crouch, wow, BB and CC, Tate Six. I think the cover is back there, and so like you don't get that a lot. In fact, in the early '80s, they used to have what they called the black issue. So they would have one issue of the month, and I don't think it lasts long. And the cool thing about them that their editorial board address these issues. So yeah, so when I'm trying to learn about this art form, and I'm buying black gospel magazines too, and you know Teresa Harrison is so important in terms of score and how that opens things up, you know, for me, like wow. And then totally gospel before that, but like this is like this was. If I went into you know one of those Christian bookstores like to see them on the cover. You know this was awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so they are. Um, they are crossing over in so many ways. And it's important because it opens up opportunities, I think, for other folks. Right. Um, and other record companies begin to say, okay, this can be profitable. Yeah. And I don't know if I completely answered your que question. Yes. In terms of racial politics. Yeah. Yes, like, you hey, did. Um, <laughs> no, no, you did. Uh, one thing, I'm just paying attention to the time because I know we've uh, sure. gone over the 30 minutes. Um, it's like 1146 now. So I guess we're just going to kind of wind down. Um, you know, you mentioned there, especially when we were talking about Shirley Caesar uh, and James Cleveland a bit. Uh, we know the significance, I guess, of gospel music in the lives of African-Americans, right? Um, mm -hmm. The Black church. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, even still today, uh, gospel music or the black church tradition of traditions of music uh, will still get otherized. You know, it's not uncommon for the random story to come up. I'm thinking of maybe like a, on a, a campus, a Christian campus, you know, it's chapel service. The black students get to do it today. And it's a predominantly white school. And there's this clash when they start sharing the music that they hold dear, that moves them. Um, and a part of it too, I think, you know, when I was doing some research, I started getting curious um, and I forgot what led me to it. Uh, but in my research, you know, Google suggested this search phrase, uh, white gospel music. I was like, I've never heard that before. White gospel music. <laughs> OK, because I always thought like, you know, folks like the Gaithers uh, and some other ones, they were just singing traditional hymns. That's how I thought of it. But I didn't know that was white gospel music. And then Google suggested another related term that people frequently search for. Right. White gospel artists that sound black. <laughs> it's like, whoa, wait a minute. What does this even mean? Um, so I guess uh, the point of what I'm saying here, I'm wondering if you can share, um, you know, how should the greater Christian communities, you know, the body of Christ, so to speak, uh, including, you know, all ethnicities and races who say we have this common aspect of our faith. 
Uh, what can we or should we appreciate about gospel music? It's development, it's presence here. How, you know, you can't look at U.S. history without going into that. Because when you look at the civil rights movement, a lot of the folks involved were believers and the music they brought in, you know, was gospel oriented. So uh, I guess the takeaway from all of this, what should it be and how can we personally have some type of appreciation or understand about the significance of gospel music? It's foundational. Hmm. And I would say that if there was no gospel music, how we operate in the world, how we feel, how we listen, how we define what it means to be who we are, what it means to be Christian, human, American, would be fundamentally different. It is um, foundational to American and African-American culture. And increasingly, as it gains attention and is one of the biggest art forms actually in the global South, when you talk about Latin America and Africa, um, it is it is just it is just central to to you know like almost I hate this term but world culture, um, and I would say, um, you know I talked about this in the book and I think it's one thing and I and I'll use Andre Crouch as this you know. In 2009, at Michael Jackson's funeral, his brothers rolled him out as Andre Crouch was singing Soon and Very Soon. And Whitney Houston, when Marvin eulogized her, he sang um, Let the Church Say Amen, which was written by Andre Crouch. Um, imagine Color Purple watching that movie without God is trying to tell you something written by Andre Crouch. Um, you can turn on an African-American station, and I'm just be honest, that plays old school and hear back that thing up and then Donnie McClurk and we fall down and we get up. And there are people who listen to that and they don't skip a beat. Um, so it is, it is foundational. And I think what happens in this moment, and that's why I think in the soul and hip hop eras, there's a tendency sometimes to look at hip hop as kind of synonymous with black culture. And I would say, no, I think if you are talking about African-American culture and gospel is not a part of that conversation, then you won't understand why Snoop Dogg goes crazy over the Clark sisters. Right. And so it is, it is, it is foundational to who we have been, who we are and what we might become. And to me, that, that's what um, the message is. And it just is. It does not need also to be explained. Gospel is not just the entry point to know more about blues or the foundation of soul, no hip hop. It can also stand on its own. And it must stand on its own. And so that's how I would answer that question. Okay, and that is a fitting conclusion to this discussion. Um, again, uh, thank you, Dr. Claudrina Harold, a uh, history professor at the University of Virginia and also author of When Sunday Comes, Gospel Music in the Soul and Hip Hop Eras. I uh, appreciate your time and, you know, all this wonderful wisdom and knowledge. Um, uh, you know, it makes me want to dig a bit more into the history of gospel music. So thank you. Thank you.